All right, well, hey again, church family, uh, welcome. It's so good to have you guys with us and everybody that's right here in the room. Um, are you excited about Miracles Part 3? Anybody? Good, good. Well, listen, before I get to that, I want to take just a couple of minutes, and, um, and I want us to talk about what's going on in the world, um, what's happening all around us in our community, our nation, and the world. Um, I want us to spend a little bit of time praying, um, and then also I want to give you a few little updates. So first off, let me just start at this spot or at this place. Um, because I know what's going on around us right now is um, it's chaotic and it's uncertain and it's a little bit crazy. Um, and the thing that I keep being reminded of over and over again is, is we as a family, Becky and I and our kids are walking through this as well. Um, I keep you know, being bombarded with news over and over and over again. And this thing is rapidly changing and things are evolving and it um, seems to get scarier and scarier and scarier. And I just keep thinking that external, outside, um, it's crazy. It's chaotic. But on the inside, it doesn't have to be. Because inside of us that are believers or part of the family of God, we've got the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And if we're not careful, what we'll do is we'll listen more to the outside voices We'll listen more to the things in the media, which we need to listen to. We need wisdom. We need guidance. We need to know what's going on. But if we choose to listen more to that than what God's telling us on the inside, then we, we will have a tendency to lean toward fear and anxiety and all those things that will just um, cause so much more havoc and so much more problems in our lives. So my encouragement is to lean in to God's spirit, lean into his voice during this time. Um, another thought that I've had throughout this is, um, it's almost like throughout the world right now, um, God's slowing us down. This is forcing us to slow down. Almost, in a way, it's almost like a Sabbath. It's almost like a, I mean, the, all the busy, all the sporting events and all the things that are closing down, all these big things that are just ending that normally take up our time, that normally take up all of our attention are stopping. And if we're not careful, we'll fill that time with more panic and more fear and news and all that instead of leaning into God's presence and also leaning into the family that God's put around us. You know, we have, a, we have an opportunity right now to spend more time with our kids and that may freak you out. It may scare you to death that you're gonna have your kids at home for a couple of weeks. But hey, instead of being afraid of that, instead of being fearful, lean into that. Allow, you know, use this time for you to lead your kids through something difficult. Let them see you leading in faith through this time. Let this be a memorable time for them, not because of the panic and the, and the disarray and all the crazy, but because they saw mom and dad stand in faith. Like, let's let this time be something that God ends up doing something good out of it, because that's what we believe. That's what Romans 8 says, right? For those of us that believe, for those of us that trust God's will, that we believe God's going to turn everything for good and he's going to do something amazing from it. Um, before I move on, I got a couple of updates and announcements that I do um, kind of want to tell you what's going on and kind of some of the things that we're changing. Um, but before we do that, I want to pray. I want us to spend some time just very focused, very deliberate prayer about this whole situation. Um, you may not know this, but in Honduras, the situation is really, really bad. They're, they're, they're doing a 14-day quarantine, the entire nation. Um, so we have a campus there. We've got family there. Um, so we're, we're going to stand with those guys. We're going to be praying for them as well through this time. Uh, so there's a lot of things happening that I want to pray for, and I'm, I'm grateful. I'm so thankful that our president called today a national day of prayer. Um, how amazing is that? Uh, that what, and what that means is right now, literally thousands and thousands of believers are praying for the same thing today. That's amazing that every church right now is, yeah, let's pray, yeah. So that's something to be grateful for, whether you agree with this politics or not. Who cares, man? It doesn't even matter at this point in time. We need to go, go before God on our knees and be praying. And I'm so grateful that he did this, that he called the nation together to pray. So every church, every believer, hopefully today, we are, we are rallying. We are coming together in faith, and we're believing for God to do something amazing. So here's what I want to do. I've got just kind of a short little list of things that I want to pray over. 
Um, I want to pray over, um, number one, God's answer for this whole thing. I want, I want to pray for a cure. I want to pray for a vaccine. I want to pray that God will give wisdom and guidance to doctors and scientists to, to find a cure or that God will just end the thing altogether. Um, I want us to pray for the medical profession. Um, all of you that are nurses and doctors, man, God has called you for this season. Uh, you are in a ministry of mercy, and God has called you for this season. And I'm just, we're going to speak that over you that during this season, that, that God's going to use you, God's going to bless you. Um, we're we're going to pray that there's no more death. No more death, absolutely not. As this thing just continues to go, that's a big prayer, it's a bold prayer, but we're going to believe it in, in, in faith. Um, and, so, and, and then we're going to pray for our leaders as they're making big decisions right now. I can't even imagine the pressure um, that our civic leaders are under right now, making the decisions that they're making. So, uh, so church family, wherever you are right now, if you've got kids with you or you're by yourself, if you're uh, wh wherever you are, I want us to pray together. I don't want to just be the only one praying. Um, so Saf family here, let's all kind of pray together. We're going to pray big, bold prayers, and we're going to believe that God's going to show up, that in the middle of this, God's going to do something absolutely incredible. Uh, so let's pray. All right, you ready? God, we come before you today as a church body. God, we are still united, Lord, even though we're physically not in the same place. God, we are united in faith. We're united under the banner of, God, your family. And right now we stand in faith and we believe, Lord. We believe that you see the big picture of this whole thing. God, you see it way different than we see it, Lord. You see something completely different. And God, we pray that you will give us wisdom and guidance as we take steps through this. Lord, as we lead our families through this, Lord, that you will help us to, to bring peace into our homes. God, that you will guide us in that. Uh, Lord, I pray for our nation, for our civic leaders, for um, our governmental leaders. Lord, we pray for wisdom and guidance as they make big decisions. Lord, I can't even imagine the amount of pressure that they're under. I cannot even imagine it. So, Lord, I pray right now that you would give them grace. Lord, that you would give them compassion. Lord, that you would give them empathy. That you would give them wisdom and guidance to lead us as a nation through this crisis. Lord, give them wisdom. Lord, I pray for every medical um, uh, doctor, nurse, everyone in the medical profession. Lord, I pray right now for just an extra grace. God, a new measure of anointing on their ministry, on their life. That through this season, God, that they would be, that they, their spirits would just be calming. God, that they would bring us in of peace into our world, God, that they would, um, they, that they would work um, with wisdom and guidance as they, as they do everything that they can do to help the situation. Lord, I lift up a cure. Lord, I just believe and pray, God, that you, will, that you will deliver, you will provide a cure for this disease, that it will not spread any longer. Lord, I pray that all these extreme measures that we're taking as a nation right now to try to flatten the curve, Lord, I pray that it will succeed, God, that it will slow this thing down, God, that it will, it will, um, it will help, and Lord, that as we as a church as we as we love our neighbors in this way trying to help this lord i pray that in our community that this thing will not take over this thing will not rapidly increase god that we will uh, that we will be protected here in our community and also around the world and lord um i lift up um and finally god i i pray right now for um for our, our staff family for our entire church family god that you will give us wisdom and guidance as we walk through this lord bless us Lord, that we can be a blessing to our community. God, that we can love our neighbors well through this. God, that we can be light. Uh, God, that we can stay together, stick together. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, well, thank you guys for praying. I want to encourage you, of course, we're, we're going to continue praying, but I want to encourage you to do the same um, every single day. Make it a, a, just a, a focus of prayer. When you get up in the morning, immediately ask, come Holy Spirit, come be a part of my life today so that you're not consumed with fear. Um, just a couple quick updates, and then I'm going to jump into the message um, because I do feel like I've got something um, that actually kind of shifted halfway through the week this week to, um, to share with you. But uh, just a couple things. One, you need to make sure that you're staying connected to all of our social media platforms, the website, um, because here's our plan. As of, this, as of this moment right now, we're really not going to make a lot of long-term decisions um, because this thing is changing so rapidly. Things are increasing. Things are shifting and changing. So we're not going to go ahead and say for the next month, this is what it's going to look like. We're going to kind of take it day by day um, and maybe week by week and just kind of see and feel it out. So you need to stay tuned in, connected to what's going on. Um, but I can say this for certainty. 
uh, that this weekend, uh, this coming up weekend, we had a men's night planned. We are going to postpone that. So that's one decision we've already made. To, we're going to push that and find us a better time in a later date for that. But as far as next weekend, there's a real good chance that we'll be online again. But at the same time, things could shift and change and we may be back together. So we're just going to, you know, kind of kind of play by ear, day by day. Um, but I do want to encourage you to stay connected to your small group um, if you feel comfortable, if you feel safe. Uh, depending on your health condition or your age, you may not feel comfortable doing that. But, man, I think it's so important because what's, what, what this thing is trying to do is isolate us. You know, and as, and as human beings, we're not built for isolation. We're not built to be separated. The family needs to be together. So if at all possible, try to stick with your small group. Start, try to stay in community <clears throat> so that we can continue being the church that we're, uh, that we're called to be. Um, and then a couple other things about kids and youth ministry. Uh, kids ministry, obviously right now our online experience, uh, we don't have a kids online experience. Um, and I hate that because I want your kids to be able to go to church as well. So um, our team's been working on something. They're going to be putting out something a little bit later on today about how you can actually have a Kid City experience with your kids at home uh, through the Parent Q app. So be watching for that because throughout this season, I don't want your kids to miss out. I want your kids to be able to have church as well and be, be able to experience God's word. Um, in that way. And then also youth ministry. Our youth team, they're working on some content that's going to be rolling out this week. Um, obviously, they're not going to be having a youth night this Wednesday night either, um, but they are going to roll out some content this week just to, again, help our students stay connected um, so that, you know, it's not all Netflix binging for the next couple of weeks, so that we've got some other content that we can put in front of our kids and our youth. So uh, again, just day by day, week by week, we're going to take it as, as, as it comes and just walk by faith through this whole season. All right, let's jump into miracles part three. That's enough about coronavirus for right now. Um, we will touch on it a little bit throughout this because I do believe, I do believe there's, there's, a, there's a theme through this whole thing and really this whole series um, because really what we're talking about is faith. I mean, that's really what we're talking about is just, it's just believing in God more than we've ever believed in God. Um, and our theme verse for this series is John 20. And I'm going to read this verse, um, and it just simply says this, and we, I think we've read it the last couple of weeks, but it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So in other words, John, John said, okay, I'm going to select, out of all of these amazing and crazy things that Jesus did, I'm going to select seven, and I'm going to include seven. Which is pretty incredible when you think about it, that out of everything that Jesus did, John chose seven. And a lot of them are actually not included in the other Gospels, which is pretty wild too. Um, that, that he chose different things. That's why we call them the synoptic Gospels. And then John's kind of this unique contribution. It's this unique thing um, because he shares stories and insight. He speaks with a different type of language. Um, so anyway, so he says, there's so much that I could have put in here that's not in here. But then he says, but here's why. I included what I included. Here's the big picture. This is the reason why. But these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I love this line. I just, my eyes keep going back to this line every single time I read it. Why did he do this? So that we may believe. And then, and then what? So that by believing you may have life in his name. So that as we understand and experience the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of Jesus Christ, it's not just a church thing that we attend, but it's actually a power in our life that truly changes who we are and what we do. What a beautiful and amazing thing. So as we walk through this journey, and we've got several more weeks to go all the way to Easter, as we walk through that, that that's exactly what this is. It's us simply going deeper into who Jesus Christ is. That for him, nothing is impossible. That no matter what we face right now as a nation, no matter what we face as a family, no matter what we're up against, whether it's this virus or whether it's work or whether it's a marriage that's falling apart or whether it's an illness, no matter what we're up against in life, that our God is amazing and there's nothing that's impossible for him. That's what this whole thing is about. So today we're going we're gonna to kind of tackle the third miracle that John records. It's in John 5. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a good bit of, of scripture. Um, so just kind of hang with me. Where, you know, whatever you're uh, sitting right now, whatever you're doing, just hang with me. We're going to read a little bit and kind of I'll comment as we go. Uh, but it's a little bit more than what we would probably normally read. So I want you to kind of lean in and connect to this. So John 5 is the story of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. Now you may be familiar with it, but let's just 
maybe kind of read it with fresh eyes and read back through this thing just in, a, in kind of a new and a fresh way. So it says this in verse 1, John 5, verse 1. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, which was the custom. All the Jews, the three main feasts, they would all go up to Jerusalem um, so they could celebrate together. And it says this, now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda which means house of mercy. The word Beth there means house. Um, so like Bethlehem is house of bread. Uh, Bethel or Bethel is house of God. So this is Bethesda, which is house of mercy. Um, and it had all these porches. It says it had five porches. Uh, this, whole, this pool was actually unearthed um, in the 60s. So it's actually there. You can actually see bits and pieces of it. But historians tell us that it was quite large. It was actually two different pools roughly 20 feet deep, um, almost the size of a football field with all these porches everywhere. So literally hundreds of people gathered, not just sick, lame, and paralyzed. There were hundreds of them, but this was a common place for people to go. It was a common place for people to bathe and, and, and swim and do laps. I don't know, whatever they were doing. Um, but also the sick were there, and there were literally hundreds of them. And, and what I find is interesting is this is the very first place that Jesus goes. When he comes into the city, Jesus doesn't go to the palace. He doesn't go to the elite. He doesn't go to the high priest. What Jesus does on day one of walking into Jerusalem is he goes to the hospital. He goes to the hurting. He goes to those that needed him the most. That's his very first stop. Like Luke 19.10 says that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That's where Jesus goes. He goes into the place that maybe not very many religious people would have gone. A lot of unclean people that were dealing with a lot of issues. And that's where Jesus goes. And then it says this, in, these, in all these alcoves, all these colonnades, these porches, lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, and they were waiting for the moving of the water. Verse 4 says, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well, whatever disease he had. Now, depending on your translation, that verse, verse 4 and the second half of verse 3 could be in a footnote because it wasn't included in all the early manuscripts, um, but it is, it's important because it explains something that's coming a little bit later on. Um, so that's verse four, the water stirred, people would jump in and they would be healed. Now verse five, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he already had been sick or been in that condition for a long time. And this is what Jesus says to him. Jesus says, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the water when the water is stirred. But while I am coming, another one steps down in front of me. And Jesus says to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and he began to walk. And then it says, and that day was the Sabbath. And Jesus had this kind of knack for healing on the Sabbath, which caused all kinds of problems and issues with the religious leaders. But from this moment on, this is the third miracle recorded in John. From this moment on, we are officially on the road to Easter because this is where persecution began for Jesus. This is where things begin to heat up. This is where things begin to turn. All of a sudden, the religious leaders take note, as we're going to see in this very next verse, the Jews therefore said to this guy, the guy that was healed, the Jews said, hey, it's the Sabbath. It's not lawful. It is unlawful for you to carry your bed. So the healed man says, it was, it was he who made me well that said to me, take up your bed and walk. In other words, I'm going to listen to him more than I'm going to listen to you. The guy just healed me. I'm going to take my bed. I'm going to do what he says. Obviously, he's greater than the law. He's greater than your rules. I'm going to do what he tells me to do. And he begins to walk because they had added all of these extra rules to the Sabbath. Like, you can't carry anything on the Sabbath. You can't heal anybody on the Sabbath. How crazy is that? Right, so they get angry. Then they asked him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. And that's important. He did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. In other words, Jesus had kind of slipped into the crowd. It was a lot of people, a lot of commotion, a lot of stuff happening. And after he healed him, Jesus kind of ducked away. And all of a sudden, this guy's healed, and he's carrying his bed through town. And the religious leaders are like, dude, what in the world are you doing? This is ridiculous. You can't carry anything on the Sabbath. And he says, do you not understand? I was just healed. 
And they get angry and persecution begins against Jesus. But what I want to do is I want to go back and I want to focus on the question that Jesus asked. Because I think it's a question that we all need to answer. Every single one of us. You know, Jesus had a way, it was, almost, it was, like, it was an art that Jesus had of asking questions. The right questions at the right time. I mean, this guy had been laying there for 38 years, paralyzed. We don't know much more about it other than that. And Jesus says, and ask him this question, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? I mean, think about that question. What an important question. <laughs> but at the same time, you're like, is that kind of an unkind question? I mean, is that kind of a weird question that this guy's been laying here for 38 years that says that Jesus knew how long he'd been there, whether that's through some sort of divine Jesus is Jesus and he just kind of knows or whether someone had told him he knows how long he's been there and he says, hey, do you want to be made well? Here's the guy sitting by the water, waiting on the next stirring, waiting to be able to get in the water and he says, do you want to be made well? Or maybe it's just unnecessary. Maybe it's the kind of question that you think, well, that's an unnecessary question. Of course he wants to be made well. But Jesus never made that assumption. Because Jesus knows that not everyone that's sick wants to be well. And unless you want to be well, you won't be well. Everybody knows somebody that has issues and problems and you try to help and you try to walk them into some sort of restoration or some sort of healing or some sort of process. And if they don't want it, it's not going to work. They're not going to get anywhere. They're not going to go anywhere. They have to want it. They have to desire it within them. I don't know what it is for you today and this season and what all we're going through, but what's the place in your life that you need Jesus to touch right now? Whether it is a physical thing or maybe it's an emotional thing, maybe it's fear. I mean, that's the season we're in right now. Maybe it's fear. You know, maybe there are other things in your life. Maybe it's relational. Maybe it's a relationship that's falling apart. It's a marriage. It's, it's kids. It's something. Maybe there's something relational or maybe it's spiritual. Maybe there's a sin, maybe there's something, but, but you desperately need it. And I'm, I'm experiencing some of this in my own life right now. I feel like I've been sitting at the pool, right next to it, right next to healing. And Jesus is like, hey, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? And I bet my guess is a lot of us right now as a church are sitting in that same spot. And there's an issue, there's a problem, there's an infirmity that Jesus wants to heal. That word infirmity from John 5, 5, this is what it says in John 5. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. You know what that word infirmity means? We assume for him it was his legs. If not, he probably would have been able to get in the water in 38 years. So we assume that it was his legs. He couldn't move. He was paralyzed, at least in some, in some form. But that word infirmity in the Greek actually means weakness. Weakness. It's the same word that Paul used in one of his most famous passages when he's talking about the thorn in his flesh in 2 Corinthians 12. Paul uses the same word right here. It, Paul says, Jesus told him, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. It's the same word. It's the same word. So maybe the question we need to ask is what weakness do I have? What weakness do I have right now in my life that needs the touch of Jesus? That needs the healing power of Jesus Christ in our life? Think about that. That's a big question. You may not know. And if you don't know, just lean over and ask your wife. She'll tell you. Right? But we all have a weakness. Every single one of us. We all have something. There's an infirmity. There's a weakness inside of us, whether it's spiritual whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, or whether it's relational, there is a weakness. There's something that every single one of us are dealing with. And yet Jesus is standing there. Jesus is asking us, do you want to be made well? And what's crazy is the guy does not say yes. This used to really blow my mind. That the guy does not say yes. He doesn't realize that Jesus is talking to him, that Jesus Christ is saying, I mean, this is the guy that stirs the waters, right? I mean, this is the guy that, you know, does this and somebody jumps in and cannonballs in and they're healed and it's woo. You know, Jesus is literally the guy doing this. Jesus is the guy that made legs, you know, like 
And he doesn't even answer him, or at least he doesn't tell him yes. And I can't help but wonder about us. We've all got a weakness. And I believe Jesus Christ is leaning down to every single one of us next to the pool that you're in, wherever that life, whatever that thing looks like. Jesus is leaning down and saying, hey, man, you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? And a lot of us are not answering yes. We're not answering yes. I want to talk about why we're not answering yes. What's keeping us from answering yes? What kept him from answering yes? The first thing that kept him from answering yes, there's three things, and I want you to write these down because I think they're important. The first thing that kept him from answering yes is excuses. He made excuses. Immediately, right out of the gate, I mean, Jesus asked him this amazing question, do you want to be made well? And he launches into a series of excuses. I can't, I don't have anyone else, and someone else gets there ahead of me. Immediately, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I don't have anybody else to help me. Immediately shifts blame. Hey, listen, this is not going to work for me. I'm the exception. It's not going to work for me. Someone always gets there ahead of me. Someone's always faster than me. Someone's always better than me. Someone always gets there ahead of me. He immediately points to someone else. He blames someone else for the lack of healing in his own life. Does that sound like society that we live in right now in any way? That we shift blame away from our own responsibility for our healing and our growth and our wholeness. And we shift blame to someone else. It's exactly what he does. Jesus Christ asks him, do you want to be made well? And he points to someone else. And he says, I would be made well if that guy hadn't gotten my way. (laughs) If that guy wasn't faster than me, stronger than me, or if somebody would have just given me a little bit of help. If somebody would have just helped the brother out, then maybe I could have gotten my healing. So whose fault is it I'm not healed? It's everybody else's fault, not my fault. The problem with a lot of our world is that we don't take responsibility for our own problems, our own issues, our own weaknesses. We keep hoping and wishing and expecting someone else to take care of them for us. A lot of us have been hurt by other people. We've been damaged. We've been, we've been affected by other people. But the thing is that no one can hinder your destiny but you. No one I mean, some of us have been deeply wounded and hurt by other people. But Jesus Christ is leaning down at the pool and he's saying, do you want to be well? And instead of pointing at everybody else, it's up to us because we are the only ones that can take a step toward our destiny, toward our healing, toward Jesus Christ and say, yes, yes, I want to be healed. Yes, I want to experience wholeness in this area. Yes, I want to step into that new life that he's called me to step into. It's like we say this, it's like we say, I believe that God heals marriages, but it just won't work for mine. I believe God doesn't want anybody to be addicted to a substance or whatever, but here's why it doesn't work for me. I believe in tithing, I think it works for everybody else, but here's why it's not going to work for me. And there's so many things that God's trying to do, wanting to do, but we just keep making excuses and pointing to all these other things instead of just answering yes. Yes, Jesus, yes, I want to be healed. In other words, what we're saying is, I'm the exception to the power of God. I'm the exception to the power of God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Jesus Christ that leaned down and asked this man this question is the same Jesus Christ is asking you the same question. And he has the power to heal us right where we are. If we could just blow through the lies that we believe, the things we've told ourselves, the excuses that keep running through our mind. If we can blow through every bit of that and we can look to him and say, yes, yes, then I believe God will do something amazing. What excuse is there that's holding you back from resa- just answering with a resounding yes? The second thing that keeps us from saying yes when Jesus asks us, do you want to be made well? The second thing is this, it's effort. It's effort. Now, I'm just going to, there's no, in, in the Bible, there's no other information other than 38 years, the water is stirred occasionally, an angel shows up, they can jump in and get healed. For 38 years, this man had not made it into the water. Now, we don't know much about it, but let's just, let's just kind of play with it a little bit and think. It, it probably didn't take a whole lot of effort for him to get in the pool, right? He could have probably positioned himself right on the edge, 
And just when the water stirred, be watching it and then just roll with it. You know, just lean and just boop, plop right in. Right? Now, we don't know much about it, but we know that in that moment, his eyes are on the water. Jesus asked him this question. Okay, and for 38 years, he had never made it in the water. And what Jesus is saying when he says, rise, take up your bed and walk, is Jesus is saying, hey, man, you're going to have to put a little effort into it. You've been sitting here for 38 years, and you hadn't at least, like, plopped in. You hadn't, hadn't, like, just rolled in, nothing. Like, you're going to have to put a little bit of effort into it. In other words, this thing is not just going to be all me, but you got to have a part in this thing, too. Because for 38 years, the two by four foot real estate that this man occupied had become comfortable. I mean, for 38 years in the same spot, the same routine, the same way of life, he had, his whole dysfunction had become normal. He lived life this way. I wonder if he was even still looking at the water at this point because it had gotten so comfortable. He knew everyone that was sitting around him. He had built a community. He had just enough self-pity and attention. He had just enough all these things. So for him to get healed after 38 years was going to mean a major life change. A major life change. Right? The amount of attention that he got. um, He'd have to get a job. He'd have to begin to contribute. Like there's so many things in his life that would change if he'd been healed. For 38 years, he had built a system for his dysfunction. And I can relate to that. I can relate to that with some of the weaknesses in my life that have been in my life for so long that I've kind of learned to deal with them. And I've kind of made it work. And it's not good and it's not healthy and it destroys relationships from time to time. It destroys my life from time to time. But you know what? It's kind of the way it is at this point. I've gotten used to it. It's comfortable. It, it is what it is. And Jesus is saying, hey, listen, if you're going to take a step, if you're going to be healed, rise, take up your bed and walk. Put a little bit of effort into it. In other words, there's a natural part of the supernatural. There's something that you and I have to do. God's going to do his part. God's the only one that can do the miracle. But he's saying, hey, are you willing to at least step up? Are you willing at least to roll up the thing that's so comfortable that you've just grown accustomed to? Roll that thing up and throw it away, man. Get rid of it. And then what? Start walking. Go. Start taking some steps toward healing. Start taking some steps toward a new life and a new way. Don't just sit and be comfortable in your dysfunction. Begin taking some steps. Begin walking. Begin doing something. Listen, your will and God's power is an extraordinary team. When those two two things team up, your will and God's power, I mean, anything is possible. But it requires our work. It requires our steps. It requires us to get up and do something. This is kind of what Eugene Peterson calls a long obedience in the same direction. It's day after day taking steps, the right steps toward where God is taking us, toward the healing that God wants us to have, toward the life that he wants us to have. There's an effort involved, but sometimes we don't want the effort. We don't want to take the effort. We've gotten comfortable in our dysfunction. So what's the mat that we need to roll up and throw away? What's the the system of kind of comfort in our dysfunction that we need to chunk, we need to throw away? And the third thing is this that keeps us from saying yes, it's experience. Or I like this word, I like expectation better. It's expectation. Because basically what this man had done for 38 years is he had an experience of what God had done Every single time was the same. God would stir the waters, something miraculous would happen, and that was his God experience. So his expectation was built on something that God had done in the past. That's the only way he ever saw God work. It's the only way he ever got, saw God move. God showed up in the same way every single time, and so his expectation was built on something old, was seeing God do something over and over again. John specifically tells us that he did not know that this was Jesus. Now, that's interesting because for 38 years, he was expecting God to show up in a very specific way through this pool, through this stirring. That's how he expected God to show up. Why? Because that's all he ever knew. He knew God was this way, but he had no idea that God had taken a human form and that God would show up in a new way, that God would do a new thing. And he just kept watching for the old and waiting on the old and expecting the old. And because of his old expectations, when this man, the Messiah, asked him, he probably didn't even look at him. 
He probably didn't even look at him. And if he had, he maybe not would have recognized him. This is the third miracle. This is really the first public miracle. For all we know, Jesus really wasn't much of a a celebrity yet. He maybe not would have even recognized him. He had no idea who it was because he was expecting God to continue working in the same way that God had always worked. His expectation was on that. In Isaiah 43, it says this, Isaiah is prophesying, and God says through Isaiah, God says, I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all of its chariots and its horses, and I drew them beneath the waters, and they drowned. Their lives lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. But look at this next part. Then he says, but forget all that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do, for I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. I've already started to do it. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Isaiah is prophesying about their current captivity in in Babylon, but he's pointing back to Egypt. And he's saying, hey, remember the last captivity that God got us out of? Okay, forget that. Because this one's not going to look anything like that one. There's a brand new thing that I'm trying to do. This healing, this miracle, this weakness that I'm trying to bring you out of, the way I'm going to do it is brand new. So forget that. Forget that. There's a new thing that I'm trying to do. This new thing that God's doing, I'm experiencing right now. I've grown up in church. I've grown up around God. I've seen God move my entire life. But what God's doing in me right now is a brand new thing. And he's doing it in a brand new way. He's using people, friends, and strangers. He's using all these different things to connect dots in a way that I've never experienced before. God's doing a brand new thing. But I had the chance to say no to every bit of it. I had the chance to say absolutely not, to ignore it, and to keep looking to the past, to keep looking to the expectations of what he's done before. But God's saying, no, no, there's a new thing that I want to do. And you know what God, through this experience, is doing? Is he's teaching me more and more about the way the family of God works. It's important. It's intentional. God's doing something intentional. He's revealing to me how the family is supposed to work together. How we're meant to move together, to operate together, to heal and help each other. Because just like that man showed up that day at the pool of Bethesda, he was God in a body. God himself was was in that body walking on the planet. You and I as the children of God, you and I as the family of God, we are God in a body. The Holy Spirit lives inside of each and every one of us. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So we come together and we help each other and we speak into each other. And that's what God's showing me in this season. He's operating and moving in a brand new way. And he's blowing through all my expectations, all these limits that I put on God because we do that. We limit God. We put him in a box. In other words, we try to create God in our own image by putting him in a box and limiting him and saying, no, no, this is who God is. This is the way God works. This is the way God operates. He can only touch a pool and stir some water. That's how it's going to happen. And we limit God. And then when God actually shows up and he says, hey, do you want to be made well? We go, well, not really. I don't care. I don't want to. That guy, we make excuses. We don't want to take the effort. Right? Because God shows up in a brand new way. Right now in our church, I believe that God is showing up in a brand new way. I think God's doing a new thing. And as a church, if we keep looking back to the old and we keep expecting that that's the only way God moves, that's the only way God operates, God's saying, no, 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 forget all that. Man, it's awesome. It's incredible. But there's a new thing I'm trying to do. There's a new thing we're doing. For us to open up our eyes and see what he's doing is so important right now. And you know what it involves? It involves us humbling ourselves. Every one of us humbling ourselves and realizing that we don't have it all figured out. That God may be trying to move and and do something in us that he's never done before. And it's going to involve some steps. It's going to involve some changes. It's going to involve seeing God in a new way. It's going to involve bigger faith. It's going to involve us leaning into, into him in a new way. There's a new thing that God is doing. A brand new thing in us personally, in our families, in our church. And if we keep leaning to the old and looking to the old, then we're going to miss it. When he walks up to us at the pool and he says, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made whole? We'll miss it. 
So I wonder how many of us need to humble ourselves. How many of us need to open up our mind and our faith to see and realize that God wants to do something new? That the old is done. There's a new thing he's doing. I wonder how many of us, God's been on us about taking some steps, about putting a little effort into something. Maybe joining a small group now would be an amazing time to get in a small group. Or maybe it's joining an AA or our recovery group. Or maybe it's, I don't know, a class, counseling. I mean, your marriage is falling apart. Maybe it's counseling. I don't know what the step is, but God's saying, hey, listen, you want to be made well? It's time to take a step. It's time to pick up that mat. It's time for you to destroy that thing and begin to take some steps. Or maybe there's a lie that you've believed. There's an excuse that you've told yourself. There's something that just keeps getting repeated over and over and over again. And it needs to be destroyed so that you can rise, take up your mat, and begin to walk. The thing about this story is that Jesus Christ has the power to heal. That's the thing. Whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're walking through, whatever our weakness, whatever our infirmity, Jesus Christ has the power to heal. And right now he's asking us to say yes. Wherever you are, whatever you're dealing with. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray a final prayer. And then before we're done for today, I just want to pray a blessing, speak a blessing over us as we head into this next week and all that's going on. But whatever's happening right now in your life, whether it's fear from the virus or just all these things, or maybe there's something else. There's a relationship falling apart. There's something internal. There's an emotional problem, a mental thing or a physical thing. I just want us to pray and believe that God, Jesus Christ is here and he's so big. And he wants to walk through it with us. He wants to heal us. He wants to change us. So right now, wherever you are, just bow your head and close your eyes. Right here in in the room, you guys do the same. Let's just take a moment and focus on God and his goodness and his grace. Let's just lean into him. Jesus, I believe right now you are asking us if we want to be made well. Whatever the weakness is in our life, whatever the thing is that we've dealt with, maybe for years, maybe for 38 years, that we've learned how to deal with, we've learned how to bury it or hide it, or we've learned how to live with the dysfunction. But I believe today you're calling us to address it, to deal with it, to surrender it to you, to say yes to that question. So whatever it is, physical, emotional, relational, spiritual, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, give us a boldness to look up and to say, yes, heal me. Lead me through the steps to healing. Help me to step up to remove the lies, to remove the expectations, to remove the stuff, and to begin to take steps toward healing right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, listen, before we go this weekend, and as we walk out into a very unknown, uncertain world, I mean, as we're talking right now, news is probably changing. It's just rapidly increasing and changing. And I just want to end today with a blessing spoken over you and your family that I believe will, will carry you through this week as you walk through this week. And I'm going to read it's from number six, and we're going to end right here. It says simply this, number six says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. That's my prayer for every single one of us this week as we walk into this week. Listen, we love you guys. We're praying for you. If you need anything, please let us know. God bless.